Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Gonna get into a pretty cool Will Eisner joint. Jimmy, what do you got up, up front? I have a Patreon, mm -hmm. patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Uh, I hold out Street Angel here because I serialized a lot of Street Angel on there. You can also find PDFs of zines and things that are out of print and impossible to get other places. Um, you know, I post art, I post writing, process stuff. If you like the Octobriana process zine, uh, this Patreon is for you. And some of the posts are public, so if you want to go sample it and check it out and see if it's something that you want, patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor, where I'm serializing the current comics project I'm working on right now called Red Room. There's some logo treatments, man. I was I was uh, practicing. Didn't decide on any of these ones, though, Jimmy. Uh, it means it's going to be hitting print pretty soon, within the next couple of months, man. More news on that later. Dark Web Murder for Fun and Profit, Jimmy. People stream these murders. Chat rooms. Chat room text goes here. It's funny because as grotesque and horrific as the image is, this text is probably ten times worse. That's for sure. Man. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jimmy, man, 1986, The Dreamer by Hashtag Will Eisner. 1986 zine. Love it. Love that setting. Yeah, part of the Will Eisner Library that was published by uh, Dennis Kitchen. Uh, a lot of books came out uh, from, from that union, man. Here's just a, but a sample of yeah. those comics. And whenever uh, Kitchen Sink Press closes up shop, all of this stuff ports over to DC. So it's not too hard to find this. This is, uh, you know, my copy is actually published by DC Comics. So fortunately, it's not too hard to track these down. Dennis um, Kitchen gets his hooks into some dudes and, and uh, make sure that that stuff uh, is published in perpetuity. Good. I, I wish more agents would, would work that way, especially for some of these books that I find out about too late. Yeah, and then for sure. they're very difficult to track down. But this one is one you can find, I believe. Yeah, nice uh, prestige format joint, maybe 64, 72 pages, I would say, man. And it's a tale, it's a it's a Dan Pussy tale, where uh, Dan Klaus comic took place in, in the uh, very specific era of like late 80s, early 90s, speculator boom, all that. This is a Dan Pussy from the dawn of comics. Yeah, reading this, it reminded me of Men of Tomorrow, which is the nonfiction book about kind of the early days of National Comics, DC Comics. And uh, it's it's very, it's the same time period. Same time period, same setting in New York. So the early days of comics, uh, fascinating subject matter. And more so because Eisner's there. You know, so you get two parts of this. One is this is the beginning of Eisner's career. The other part is this is the, the latter half of his career once he's gotten interested in uh, graphic novels as a format, so kind of a, a a book that I don't know if anybody else could do. The Dreamer, intended as a work of fiction, ultimately took the shape of a historical account, man. And uh, what do they say about history being written by the winners or something like that? Uh, it's a very kayfabe version uh, where our guy, uh, I, for, I forget his name, we'll, we'll, we'll see it in, in here, comes out smelling rosy. Yeah, no doubt about it. The, uh, <laughs> the, the Eisner, the, the, the name of the Eisner Awards, uh, definitely the, one of the winners from comics history. Fun to see that perspective as well. I thought you were going to say those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it because, um, well, there, there's a lot of stuff that happens in the early days of comics that continues to plague that industry, and, and we'll cover some of that here too. Let's get into it, Jimmy. Page one, man, you start with that newspaper headline piece, and I was trying to figure out, is all that shit hand-lettered? I don't think it is. I look at this this uh, kind of skinny text mm -hmm. right there, and it looks like a Xerox of a Xerox kind of thing, but it really integrates well with his actual hand lettering. And Eisner, one of the master letterers of comics. Dude, this whole page, we could probably just spend the episode on. It's yeah. gorgeous all over. You know, one of the great integrations of the lettering is the box of the newspaper, which obviously is drawn by him. So, you know, whether he's setting that, whether that's uh, mechanical type somehow manipulated or not, Having it in that frame really helps tie it to the page and connect the lettering to the art, even if it's mechanical lettering. Uh, but his cities, I, to die for, you know, as a guy who can't draw cities very well or took a long time to figure it out, didn't grow up in a city, I would look at his art of these cities and just in awe. It's almost like taking the city and turning it into a beautiful landscape. Down to the people that populate that city, man, the different fashions. Like, he's steeped in this world, man. Like, it all feels authentic. Absolutely. And notice the black of the case under our artist, under our hero's arm, right in the center of the page there, right under the title. From the land and school, 
this is your composition. Put those blacks, that's what's going to draw the eye in right in the center of, the, of this composition. That's a title page right there. Yeah, it's incredible. So the dreamer uh, is a sort of a late motif of, of the, the story. Like it's a theme that carries on uh, through with almost everybody uh, that we encounter. They all have their dreams. Yeah, very first character that, that our hero encounters, she sells dreams. Yeah, a little fortune teller, old, 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 old heady. Type, type character. And the banging of the dream drum in all of the text is probably one of those heavy-handed pieces that people would criticize Eisner for melodrama. Certainly of a time that he grew up, I think, would be the influence for this kind of writing, this type of style, but it would be one of the cri criticisms I've heard. And he would never be criticized for it if he wasn't pretentious with the way that he would kind of like sell himself as like the great graphic novelist. If he would have just, because this is a this is a really good comic book, but when he get would get on his high horse and get very didactic and, and soapboxy about what it is he's doing, people would point to things like that. There's no conversation I'm less interested in having than defining graphic novel or, or any of this nomenclature. But the flip side is comics are in libraries and bookstores and sold and packaged this way partially due to that language. You know, it's a, it's kind of a double edged sword. I just want to make comics. Yeah, <laughs> but. It is important, but it is the thing people poke at. So you're the guy who wants to make comics, man. You're going to let the publishers and all that handle, handle the rest of the stuff. And we got our uh, young Will Eisner right here, man. He, uh, whatever the fuck his name is. Um, he's working at the printing, uh, a printing house. And some uh, goon comes in, man, he, a mafioso type. He's got, that, he's got that suit on, that zoot suit. And this is exactly in line of what I'm saying about that Men of Tomorrow book, like, there was organized crime all around comics <laughs> in printing and distribution. And uh, that, that mafioso, <laughs> he's a printer of Tijuana Bibles. <laughs> They're doing sex? They're doing all oh, sex? <laughs> Is this legal? Don't you worry about those distractions, says this Tony Soprano type character. Yeah, that guy was all smiles until he asked about the legality. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to go home and think about it. And as he ponders, you know, goes back home with mom and dad. And, and the dad is like, listen, man, you got to... You got to uh, sort of search within yourself. If it's the right thing to do, do it. If not, don't, man. It's a lot of money he, that's on the table, and he's taking a gamble. I love the idea of the drawn table in the common room. That was the Eddie P household, man. My parents carved space yeah, in their awesome. house, man. Like My dad worked at a, uh, at a, uh, uh, like a steel mill, and they used, they, when they graduated to AutoCAD, uh, he brought home this desk that could fit. 11 pages, 11 by 17 pages wide, so I could put a whole 22-page comic on, on the front. But then he knocked up my mom uh, <laughs> when I was 18 and uh, had to make space for the baby, man. <laughs> hey, don't turn the page yet. Point out a couple of these things that I think are amazing, great. Study Eisner for this stuff. Body language. Oh, yeah. So, you know, all of the mafioso stuff, Billy's the, the main character. His shying away, being, uh, you know, surprised by the content of these comics, the shadiness of it. The body language is incredible. It's a superhero comic, practically, and how animated and demonstrative these characters are with their body language. Incredible. Again, this is something that is practically lost today. Everybody's just these stiff little characters. This is so animated. The other piece, and we'll see it on every page, these page layouts are gorgeous. You know, open panels, uh, no border, no hard border around a bunch of the panels, laying out a room where it's like a stage of like, oh, the drawing table, the old man sitting in his chair in a window, that's all you need. Every single page is like this, of just gorgeous, gorgeous page layouts. I feel like he, I bet you he uh, drew some of this stuff just from memory, man. Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think so. And it lo it feels like immediate, like it's... uh just sketch from life it's this goes back again to that landing course like this is a time period where the the cartoonist had to be able to invent this stuff fast out of your head maybe have a little morgue file but you don't have setups and photographs of, of, of your mom over the stove in the back room like this is coming out of your brain dude shit's getting fun man our boy billy is going back to uh to the print house and turns down that comic drawn job the the boss man mr davis at the print shop He's like, who do you think was going to print those fucking books, man? We need work. You're fired. Get get the hell out of here, man. So Very expressive lettering. He's got to go get his shine box. That guy's pissed off. Big, big bold letters. He's going to start uh, 
chopping a portfolio around, man. Uh, it happens upon, it's a cartoonist union that's, that's uh, springing up. And they all agree that we won't do anything for less than seven bucks a page. And while they're leaving, see, I could totally imagine, you know, your average jobber leaving a unionization meeting and telling their other jobber friends, man, I'll do some stuff for like $3. Like you, because we see this in comics, man. It's like, you know what? We all stuck together. Maybe you wouldn't get those shitty wages. How did the film companies, like how did the unions come out of film? I it always wonder. It contemporary time period, right? The, the, the teens, the 20s, like how did they form those unions and the cartoonists never never could put that together? Yeah, I always wonder. I think I think it has to do with, with the extroversion of the actor and the introversion ah, of, of the artist, man. Like those people, like they are full of ego and you get enough of them and you know you get Mae West and Clark Gable to sit on their ass and say I ain't doing shit could be the lawyers too like the contracts would have been a, a much you know like like this is guys walking in you know walking into the office with their portfolio on Monday and getting a job to bring back on Wednesday there's no lawyer or agent in between that yeah. there's not a bunch of contracts that are going to lock up the talent for years at a time so and there's not much money they're arguing over right. three dollars or five dollars uh, you get some money involved, you get those agents. <laughs> you get people sniffing around that they're going to take little pieces of that money. So maybe that's part of it, just the, the small-time op. Maybe it's New York, too. You know, you get two into the unions, and who knows? Maybe that, that, that printer, the guy who's making those Tijuana Bibles gets involved and <laughs> right. discourages you. And it's, uh, I don't know, but it's it's funny to think of, like, you do see these unions show up in other creative industries, but it never it never happens in comics. Yeah, it never will. It, it'll be impossible. There's too many people willing to undercut. I'm uh, glad to see him touch on it, though. Yeah, it's great to see that piece of history because there are moments in comics history. We know Neil Adams had had some organizational talks. Com- comes comes up every every decade or so, man. But you know, the goofballs will. Uh, what 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 did uh what did they call it in uh that words and pictures scum. <laughs> right yes dreams are the motif right so we're going to see some examples these are some of the people that were at the union house man but uh turns out that it's one of these goofballs dreams to actually be a publisher right at the same time when when our main guy is trying to get some work at that local magazine Socko, the fun magazine and all of this stuff is analog names for real life things so K Fabers in the comments, by all means, let us know because we know a couple of them. We know some of them. We don't know them all, and I'm sure Sako is some analog to you know a, a big top comics or one of those tip top comics. There's a, there's a there's trouble at the engraving house, man. One of the plates it keeps uh, tearing up the paper, and our guy Will Eisner, <laughs> yes, Willie <laughs> worked, worked at a uh, a print house, so he knows what to do, man. And this is in line with that S- Superman book where they were talking about totally. you, you go down to the engraver, you you sort of burnish off the uh, the sort of jag jagged pieces of the plate, and then run it back through the presses, man. It's not going to tear up your paper anymore. You know, as the counterpiece to Pussy, this is real fun because you don't get to see that part of the production. You know, like by the eighties. 90s even 60s that's kind of your distance from yeah that. everything is so striated in terms of specialization but at this stage everybody's figuring out what they're doing and so it's like got to run down to the print shop so he's gonna that's also charlton right i mean like right. charlton was a commercial printer western same thing and it's like well get some comics on those presses and boom becomes comics publisher Young Will Eisner saves the day, man. Uh, When he was showing off his portfolio to that guy, the dude wasn't that impressed, but he saved the day. Uh, They're able to run these books off, make some money. And the publisher's like, listen, man, I'll give you you a couple pages uh, in in, in this book. Uh, When he's back home, see right here, man, he's working on a little pirate comic called Hawk, right? Check this shit out right here, man. We're going to do a video on this baby. Will Eisner's Hawks of the Seas, man. His first uh, comics. Look at that, man. First major work from 1936 to 38. That's a wild book. A Weekly Sunday. And uh, pretty pretty strong stuff, but still learning. Yeah, definitely. So far removed from what we think of as Eisner. So far, same same guy that did these pages. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) The name of the guy who did Hawks of the Sea is uh, Willis Renzi. And we're going to see... Our, our guy Willie used that exact non de plume when he starts to pad out his studio. I love this sequence too because this is this is the young cartoonist, super excited, has his four page story due on Monday, pulling all nighters, putting his everything into it. This is the dreamer's op- opportunity. 
Yep. And uh, right when it's about to come out, guess what, man? The magazine closed down. So he's got uh, 15 bucks owed to him. His pops has 15 bucks that he could lend him, $30. He's going to go in on his own business. So he's got to go call uh, his boy, we'll call him Iger. Was it Jerry Iger? Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, a little bit of promo cutting. It's Will Eisner's money. See, this is this is that thing where, you know, history is written by the, by the winners because we don't know Mr. Iger's uh, story. So Eisner is the guy who has all the money. He's going to put in all the dough. But then we got our fellow right here who's like, okay, but I'm a 50-50 partner. And Eisner's, oh, his name is Willie Iron. The compromise is that because he's the one putting in the dough, he gets his name up front. And then we get all of this stuff about how uh, how uh, Iger is like the cheap one. Yeah, I love this sequence too. This is a lot of information that's being, throughout this book, this history part of comics, Eisner condenses it and makes it very easy to understand what's happening. And this, these are the shops. This is, uh, I would imagine, Simon and Kirby, you know, being a shop. Uh, kind of a similar idea where you have you these guys books. coming together exactly. And then you sell that to different publishers. You get maybe contracts with those publishers. But that was a common method in the early days of comic books for anybody unfamiliar with that. Because, you know, one thing they talk about throughout here, the, the Eisner stand-in, is how comics are really popping up there everywhere. You know, it's big demand. Pulps are dying and we'll see different, you know, that that's mentioned throughout here. But it's a demand for the content. And so the idea is, as a shop, we'll have guys doing backgrounds, we'll have guys doing lettering, we'll pass these pages around, and we will just churn this stuff out. You're a salesman, you go to these publishers, see what they need, you know, get us get us however many pages that we can do for them. And, you know, it's not just Eisner, uh, Eisner Igor's shop that was doing it. Those shops were common. And mm -hmm. if you read, like, old fandom or interviews with old-timers, a lot of them talk about different shops where they came up through or learned some stuff or worked at or had friends, whatever. Uh, pretty common, almost like territorial wrestling or something, sure. to, to put this in, in uh, kayfabe terms. Little cottage industries, man. But Eisner explains this, you know, in, in two thirds of a page there, and uh, we're off and running. So I'm, I'm sure that he's, he's, you know, taking some liberties and condensing this stuff to make it easy to read. But I commend him because it is easy to read. Like, this is a very easy book to read for, I think, anybody that has any interest in comics. Yeah, and he's getting his shit in there against Iger. Mm -hmm. You know, three, four panels about the guy's cheapness and, <laughs> and how he's the one that put all the money in. <laughs> Great anecdote on the following page, man, where Eisner's working super, super late on a deadline, eating a little snack, and he overhears, like, the mafia dudes in the next room talking about fixing a race at the Trotters the next day. So he puts all the rest of his uh, petty cash, man, <laughs> on the exact horse that he hears them talking about. And it turns out that... Uh, it was the wrong horse. He bet on the wrong horse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, and then you see the guy. All right. Back to work. Yeah. Back to work, Will. Good job. Eisner. I mean, Iger uh, is the salesman of the team, just kind of like uh, Simon and Kirby. Like Simon was the dude trusted with, uh, you know, getting the jobs. Eisner was the workhorse. Yeah. And this is where we're talking about those first two panels. Pulps are dying. They're, they're looking for illustrations because they're pulp publishers. And, uh, and Igor is being like, listen, those things are dying. You want comics. Comics are what are selling. Yeah, this is cool. So, and that's Iger over there. Uh, sells them on some stuff. Comes out leaving with, with uh, 10 monthly pages. So, like, who do you got? Like, how many guys you got? Can you handle those deadlines? Iger calls the shop. And, and I love this uh, part. yeah, Eisner's like, we got Spencer Steele, J. Morgan Thomas, Willis Renzi, the, the artist of this Hawks of the Sea. Each of these nom de plumes is a real nom de plume that, that Will Eisner used during his Love it. comic book days. I wonder if Agent X is a real strip just like uh, the Hawks of the Sea or, you know, some something close to that. Who knows? Like one of the fun things with these kind of uh, like pussy or like, like this kind of thing is like you can plug in those fake names if you need to. But it's also possible it was a real strip. Like think of how much of that stuff would have been floating around, proposals, even published that we would never even hear of yeah yeah for sure and there will be even sections where they're in the shop and they just have fully realized like ideas that they didn't even show anybody yet um just in case it's like r&d money for their business now this is this is a good one right here man donald harrafield man that would be harry donenfeld the uh one of the uh, backers uh, of DC Comics, yeah, National Comics, National. Detective Comics, whatever the heck it was called right at that moment. 
and a guy who's heavily covered in Men of Tomorrow. That's kind of the main focus of that book is the DC storyline is the main one. Right. And these are uh, these guys are in business. They they were a printer to begin with. There's a there's a guy who's in debt to them pretty deeply. He has a big print bill, big tab, uh, and he's a pulp publisher or something, man. But they get the idea of you know we know what how many we print. We know what the returns are. Let's buy him out. He can't last that much longer. And then we'll just uh, pick up that that job. Why? Because publishing was just a dream for that dude. And it's also their dream to be publishers. Yeah, and it's also an opportunity. This is, if you've seen uh, the founder, the McDonald's, Yeah, it's it's almost the double dip. So he says, even if the comics publishing thing is just kind of break even, we're getting the money from our printers. You know, like we're running our printing presses. I mentioned Charlton a minute ago. That's kind of the model for some of these companies that were printers. You want you make money when those presses are running. Uh, whether the comics are profitable or not, that's a different division, uh, you know, a separate entity. But you're going to get paid two or three times this way. Such a great in- entrance. Yeah, he's great. To this gangster ass dude. So flamboyant. Yeah. A little furry collar. A little, uh, what, what was that called? London Fog? Yes. Got that London Fog on? Yeah, that guy's great. He would be a dude like Iceberg Slim who calls his coat a vine. <laughs> uh, you know, show Maxwell respect. I think that's Max Gaines. It has to be. Uh, who, who comes up with famous funnies was also instrumental in Superman being picked up by DC Comics. That's part of Max Gaines that I learned while we were doing the show, by the way. Because we all know him from EC Comics, of course, being father of of Bill Gaines and the founder of EC Comics, but has a longer history in comics and a really important role. So, yeah, that's who I assume uh, Maxwell is. And here's the idea. Uh, Comic books at this point are just reprinting uh, stuff from the newspaper strips, but they're running dry on that stuff. And also, the popular shit is expensive. You're not getting a little Annie Fanny and you're fly by night nonsense. But there are enterprising new cartoonists out there in the wild and Max Gaines is a dude who 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 comes across Slam Bradley and Spy Smasher and strips like that by Siegel and, and Schuster. They talk about this strip called Big Hero, t- two kids from Ohio. Lots of action. <laughs> There's so much of that. <laughs> but but in uh in Eisner World, it's called Bang Comics. Just wait till we get Lou Fine. <laughs> yes. Two panels apart from one another, he drives that one home. Yeah, and uh, and this is one of your pieces of comics history. Make sure to protect our ownership stamp for all rights and titles on the back of each check we pay out. <laughs> yeah. That seemed to work out well for them, huh? Somebody made some money. Now, I mean, studio, shop, call it what you want. New York sweatshops, they were pretty... Uh, ubiquitous back then man uh in in new york city it's modern times make a factory make make an assembly line yeah and by the way uh this uh little shop right here it's not too different than the kayfabe compound with the amount of drawn tables and stuff <laughs> in here we we packed about a half dozen dudes in a room a I time thought, or two i thought you were going to reference like cubert school it feels like that could every have been classroom that, class yeah yeah every classroom had looked like that I miss those days. We had drafting when I was in high school. That was still a thing. And they were beautiful, the drafting tables. And it was the same setup. The ones at the Kubert school, um, they would have this like green kind of uh, top mm-hmm. that because the, the goof, maybe Steve Bissett and those guys <laughs> fucking were using X-Acto <laughs> blades on the, on the table and, and jamming them all up and getting, cutting their names in there and stuff. This is fun too. Like, They bring in the assembly line, but it's still faster, faster, faster. And so Eisner comes up with, we could do pre-printed pages, you know, with the borders and everything. So they just have to fill them in. But he hates to do that because of the quality sacrifice. And uh, Iger's like, or Iger? Iger's like, don't worry about the quality. (laughs) Like, speed is what we're chasing here. (laughs) Yeah, we're we're not going in art galleries now, man. Like, uh, you're not getting paid by the pencil line. How about this part right here, though? Man, one of the jobbers at the Eisner Iger shop uh, just sold Rodent Man to uh, Her- Harry Donenfeld. Rodent Man. <laughs> I wonder what that one is. <laughs> Deflator Mouse. <laughs> oh, here we go, man. Now, now we're going to get into the dreams of the sort of all-stars of the Eisner Iger shop. And I don't know all the, all the references, man. So this is the part where the K-Favors are going to come through and illuminate some of the stuff for us, man. This is one of the big ones, Lou Sharp, or right. as we know him, Lou Fine. His stuff would be reprinted in the 80s by some different companies. 
and uh, the reprints aren't great. Like I would see them and be like, I don't understand. Like I don't know what the what the big deal is. And some of it was craft. You know, it's just like their ability with with pen or brush and line work or figures. You know, it was a bunch of these skills that I just did not appreciate at the time. Yeah, and he he's considered the superstar from all of those guys. Yes. Kirby interviews, he talks about Lou Fine, certainly Will Eisner, C.C. Beck, like all those old timers are like, Lou Fine is the man. Yeah. So there's all this stuff like, uh, bet Lou can draw a finer line than you, <laughs> Billy. And then, uh, let's have a duel, draw a fine line, Billy. Like all this, you know what <laughs> like I'm Like a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like having a, it's like a rap battle. <laughs> Who, 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 who the can world's do, most timid rap battle. Yeah, who can do the thinnest line with a brush That's is funny. the winner. I love seeing them drag their little fingers across the page, though. If you've ever seen people paint pinstripes, yeah. it's the same kind of deal where it's like there's technique, like all form. It's just so much form involved. Yeah, man. All right. So that's did we know. Uh, Armand Bud, anybody's guess. I don't know. But, but uh, here's a clue. Whoever the Armand Bud uh, analog is, his daughter worked at Eisner Iger as well. So yeah, noteworthy. I, I don't know who it is either, yeah. but one of the kayfabe cats will. Uh, then there's a uh, Gar Tooth. Is there a dude with last name Bone Mouth? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that Gar. Like that's a that fish. That's such a strange name for like a fake name. Like it's got to have some analog that makes total sense, and we just don't. I'm just missing it. Yeah. All right. We all know this one. Jack King. Not the most flattering portrait of uh, of Jack King in that first panel, though he looks much better later on whenever at the bottom of the page when he's standing up to the to the muscle. Famous story, too. Uh, you can find uh, Jack Kirby talks about it in his Gary Groth interview, so you get his point of view. You can uh, search for Jack Kirby's name on on YouTube. Go to the you know the hour long videos or whatever. There's a documentary on Kirby and and Eisner's in there. Tells the story about young feisty scrappy uh, Jack Kirby um, screaming at the mafia dudes who who provide towels for like like towels in New York to this day, man. If you take a walk, like when you're staying at that hotel, you take a walk at like twelve at night, man, you just see piles of towels outside of hotels. It's a it's a big racket, you know? And uh this guy provides the towels for for the entire building and and it's not a good enough deal for for Will Eisner, so he turns it down. Young Jack King, he he ain't having none of that. So he comes out barking like a little chihuahua. And the way Eisner tells the story is we really appreciated Jack doing that and everything, but we got the towel service. Like, you can't say no to these guys. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Bowers, Bob Powell? Maybe. I mean, Bob Powell's another one of those guys like a Lou Fine that when I was coming up, you would hear, you know, this guy was great. And they reprinted a lot of that. Mr. Monster reprints some of that stuff, like like uh, some of his sci-fi stories, and they are beautiful. So that would be my guess. The name looks real similar. It does. It's almost, yeah. And uh, they give us a little anecdote here, man. He's he's the uh, he's in it to win it, man. He's the Bob Powell's the money guy. He's just trying to make a couple of dollars. And then is, uh, is that Gar Tooth? Is the uh, <laughs> I think so. Is the loud mouth? Oh no no no! Uh, Bob Powell is yeah. a loud mouth, just going for the dollars, man. But Gar Tooth, you know. He believes in this stuff, goes over, lays the dude out, goes back to his drawing table, and they all go to the bar afterwards. This is so reminiscent of uh, of Pussy. You know, like like the profile, all the cartoonists in the, in, totally. the, in the class, in the shop. Yeah, it's just that, uh, you know, Dan Klaus can't help himself, and the guy's names are like <laughs> Dick Spurts and, <laughs> and Hy- Hyman Roth and shit like that. We got a Will Eisner guy, man, he's getting hit on by... One of his co-workers' daughters, but he's he's too busy, man. He's he's in it to win it, and he ain't trying to get distracted by 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 females. Yeah, and it's a, a little self, uh, I don't know, congratulatory, and that everybody's cutting out for the night, but but not him, man. He's sticking at the board. But it's also that thing too, man, where he's like, you know, like it's what the boss it's. The boss can't be fraternizing, man. Like these guys, they need to cut loose. They're going to be talking shit about how 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 crappy they're being paid here, man. They need that space to do that because you know what, man? They're going to have to come back tomorrow and get back to work. Yeah, he's very right with that. Uh, but she does try, and he says, romance just isn't part of my 
not part of marriage isn't part of my plans right now. And then there's the great sequence of uh, after the rejection, walking away lonely, you know, living that dream. And guess what? Heading back to the drawing table. Yeah. Good stuff. Now, I guess we're going to be getting into, uh, you know, is this a part of the lore? Like the, you know, accountant for DC Comics is the guy who starts up Fawcett or something? Or is he Victor Fox? Because I, think, I don't know. Because I think we're going to be getting into Shazam, Cap- Captain Marvel. This guy, Vincent Raynard, like, I think I think that's supposed to be Victor Fox. That sounds right, yeah. Uh, but he didn't, I mean, did he create Fawcett? Or did he create, because, I mean, Victor Fox was a publishing company unto itself. Fawcett was a different thing. But did he inspire the uh, Captain Marvel comic? That's something that... You know, I'll trust the K favors to to put in the comments. Yeah, and I don't know what Eisner's connection was to that. If that's just something that makes, you know, if that's a uh, storytelling liberty. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's a that's a possibility too. Because it does feel like it's definitely the Captain Marvel story that we're seeing here. You know, the copy Superman uh, or Big Hero. You know, in court, we're going to see him in court over it and stuff. But I don't know if Eisner was involved in that. This is also another one of those. uh, Yeah, you're right. This is another one of those uh, Dan Pussy moments where uh, these guys clearly are coming up with the idea and commissioning him to 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 do the comic. And then when litigation is involved, uh, the people who who um, set everything up, they want to change your story. How about this next yeah, a little lot of, piece, a lot, man? A lot of crim- a lot of uh, immoral behavior <laughs> of a lot of people in this comic. Let's get to some more uh, technical immorality, man. Salacious. Yeah, like young, young, young Will, whatever the fuck his name is, man, gets his dick wet for the very first time, and he he falls in love, man. <laughs> He's in love with this lady right here. Yes, indeed. With this Mae West hair. But then when he goes back to uh, the, the the studio, he's talking about this beautiful girl that he just met. And uh, <laughs> I, Jerry Iger's like, yeah, I had to give her $30, man. For what? For last night. And then uh, he, has to, he has to break the news to the love-struck little uh, Will Eisner, man. She's a pro, Billy. She's a pro. <laughs> Makes me think of Garth Ennis' comic, The Pro. <laughs> All right, here he is, man. This or C.C. Beck, uh, Will Eisner by way of C.C. Beck, doing his uh, Shazam comic, Hero Man. And uh, guess what, man? Harry Donenfeld and crew, they're going to be suing. They're going to be suing those guys. And they're uh, the publisher of Hero Man, the, the comic that's a swipe from Big Hero. They're into Will Eisner for like three grand, the Eisner Iger shop. And they're never going to see a dime. He threatens them. You're never going to see a dime if I get sued and I can't pay you. So come show up to court. Just let them know that that you came up with the idea. That's like that um, that computer stuff, dude. When they created those clone computers and like the legalese of like how to do that, right. where, you, where you have to get you reverse engineer it and you break the patents and, and figure it all out yourself so that you know for a fact how it works. But then you have to find a really really smart kid and just give them the parts. And they have to do it on their own, and you can kind of check the work. And and, and 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 by doing that, and by having them be pure, you can have your clone computer that can run Windows and shit like that. Yeah, Halt, halt and Catch Fire, I think, was a TV show that, that, that covered some of that territory. Eisner shows up uh, to the uh, litigation, and he can't perjure himself. Why? Because the heroes... Uh, get to write their own history, man. <laughs> and he gets to be a hero. Even some of this line work reminds me of Klaus. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, especially from that period of uh, of uh, yes. Dan Pussy. And look at that little shrug, man. That's some good acting right there. <laughs> the little publisher can't even look at it. Victor Fox can't By even way, look at it. By the way, you don't want to throw that shrug as you're walking out of the courtroom and the jurors are watching you. <laughs> <laughs> that looked a little suspicious. I know, right? <laughs> Uh, this we're going to be getting into spirit territory pretty soon, Jimmy, because uh, Eisner Iger Shop they're out three grand, and uh, they got to they got to do their best to try to figure out how to make comics work. So 
Uh, this is like sort of where comics went for a while, man. Ads uh, for for various things. Um, starting your own syndicate. That's another move. These are the guys in the shop coming up with their own strategies. So uh, if you if you believe this to be a history, then uh, some dude in the shop. How about uh, turning famous literature into comics, like the Count of Monte Cristo? I guess these guys created Classics Illustrated, which I plan to look at on this on on this channel at some point soon. I have a few pulled. Nice, interesting history with all of that stuff too. Yeah, it's it's. I dig all this, man. It, you know, it's it's so much fun to go through this. And again, like I think he is blending different stories in order to make it all get that history all in here. Mm -hmm. So it's probably more time accurate than like one person going through it, which is why it's Billy Iron and not Will Eisner. Right. Uh, but it's 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 fun storytelling. Like I'm glad that he made that choice rather than limiting it to only his experience. Yeah, sure. But this is the meeting where. Uh, the newspaper syndicates, uh, they're noticing that comics are very, pretty popular and are kind of eating up the newspaper strips for lunch, thanks to Superman, thanks to, thanks to uh, Ronin Man. <laughs> uh, so they want a comic book every Sunday for the newspapers. I like that one dude's name is Beansy because there's a dude Beansy Gator on uh, Sopranos. <laughs> so this is essentially the meeting that helped build uh, the, the the spirit supplemental strips, man. And this is like one of those classic professional stories that all, all your heroes tell you to do, man, is when a cool opportunity comes up, you just say yes. I was going to say that exact same thing. <laughs> you got to say yes. And, and what we're talking about is we need a 16-page comic every Sunday. The Eisner Iger Shop is uh, a whole responsibility unto itself. So a choice has to be made here. Uh, are you going to poach that business? Like, it's inconceivable that you're going to do 16 pages all by yourself. Yeah, I love that they outline that it's a big risk, too. You know, like, he's got a successful business there. Yeah. The other piece of that is, uh, you know, one of the guys pitching says, you'll be addressing adults as well as kids. Yeah. And, and Eisner, you know, or his stand-in says, I've always dreamt of having a newspaper audience, which is what all these cartoonists dreamt of for right. decades. Because, like... Those were the biggest paid storytellers, artists, visual artists, you know, name your poison. Those top syndicate guys for decades were like the top artist, creator, writer type guys in terms of pay. And, you know, you're drawing a comic book and you're looking over there and being like, that guy's drawn, you know, a page and a half, equivalent of a page and a half a week and getting paid hundreds of times what I'm making in, in some cases. The, the That's where they were looking. The cartooning in, in comic books didn't catch up to the strips until like Carl Barks came along or in the EC guys came along. And that was, that's just in terms of art, but in terms of the cartooning, like Carl Barks and Jack Cole are probably the few guys that brought like really sound, cool cartooning to the comic book. And, and that, and that comes 20 years into the game. Too. You know, like you can name a couple of guys that were doing good comic, good cartooning right. at that time period because they were the exception. Yep. So this is about uh, folding the Eisner Iger shop or the Iron Samson shop. And he's going to go off, man, to uh, basically create his his most popular work. Yeah. This is a cool book. Yeah. I, I dig it. You know, I read it whenever... I got it whenever DC did their publication of it sometime in the 2000s. Probably whenever we were meeting at Phantom of the Attic, Ed, is probably when I picked this thing up. Um, let's see. 80... It's from 86. 2000 is the first DC printing, so maybe a little bit after that is when I picked it up. Great to revisit this. I think the comparison to Pussy is a really good good one for if anybody's watching this and they've read that book and like it but haven't read this. Comics about comics, man. And history of comics. Like, this is just a lot of fun. And Eisner, this is cool stuff. You know, like, he's kind of at the top of his game, especially that graphic novel second second part of his career, top of his game on this. The pages are just beautiful, beautiful pages, and uh, it's not overly melodramatic. Right. You know, I think the focus being on the comics industry and, and his history of, you know, connected to that, uh, it really makes for, I don't know, it's perfect formula. This is one of my favorite Eisner reads. Yeah, me too, and that's why we covered it here today on Cartoonist Kayfabe. Uh, Kayfabers, like, follow, subscribe, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. We've, we've been putting videos up very regularly. Yeah, and I would say to people, if there's a, a subject you're looking for, 
give a search because there's a good chance we might have already covered it. That happens every week. I see comments and they're like, oh, you should do a video on this. And it's like, here's the link. Right. So don't be afraid to look into those archives. We've got several playlists and, and quite a back catalog, uh, you know, for all the all the people that are new to Cartoonist Kayfabe. Check that stuff out. Where should people find you, Jimmy? Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. You can find PDFs of my zines and comics that are out of print and hard to find. You can find a lot of artwork, behind the scenes, process stuff, all, all those good things. Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor is where I'm giving a sneak peek look of my Red Room comic. It's going to be out in print in a couple of months. More news on that later. But right now there are two issues completely online. Three bucks to get you the archive. And I put up new strips every Tuesday. You can subscribe to the cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything that we are doing you can find cartoonist kayfabe merchandise and t-shirts at the links below this video give them one more set of margin orders jimmy we'll be on our way read more comics